Hey everybody and welcome back to Kerbal Space Program RP0. We are out here on the launch pad today with something I am super, super excited about. Thanks to some new technologies, namely this cockpit and this cargo bay, I think we finally have a working space shuttle. Uh, light as it may be and, I don't know, as uh, <laughs> technologically unadvanced as it might be, I think it works. It has worked in... Uh, various simulations that I have indeed almost broken the bank over but uh, it doesn't break up on re-entry and it gets to orbit just fine and so today we are not running a simulation this is a live actual launch uh, we have a fully staffed crew of five Kerbals thanks to two in the cockpit I guess I'll just go ahead and open this up and show you the goodies that we can haul to orbit uh, we have this crew container that carries three Kerbals, a complement of ultralight long-range satellites, a couple of science experiments, some emergency parachutes because wheels are terrible. Go ahead and get that closed up. All right, and uh, well, I guess I'll talk about this more during the launch, but I'm super eager to get this underway and uh, actually prove that we can use 1960s technology to build a working space shuttle and Kerbal Space Program. It is, uh, I don't want to say 1964, I'm not exactly sure. I wish it would display you the date. Oh yeah, here we go. <laughs> it is 1964. And we're going to launch a space shuttle. So, uh, alright, ignition sequence start on our three J2 engines. They are lit. We'll get those clamps off and then fire up our ten total uh, Minuteman M55 boosters that will get us off the pad and up to speed. Hopefully. Provided none of them fail. I've had lots of problems with these engines conking out on me before. Although we've been researching them and I've been doing some uh, just test firings. You know, slap a sounding rocket core and some fins on them and shoot them off the pad. No, that was really worth filming. This, however, totally is. So we're gonna try to ride this silly thing to orbit. And uh, if everything goes well, hopefully you, uh, we can all just watch this in time warp. And as we get uh, going a little more, I'll talk more about the shuttle and how it's supposed to work. I guess we'll uh, we'll see what happens. <laughs> right. So, in this time warp sped up thing, we are now actually coming up on booster set already. Uh, I'm having just a little trouble angling it down. There go the boosters. Uh, that gives me a little bit more control authority to start uh, angling in. I know I'm way off prograde vector, but um, for as much power as this thing has, it's well well worth it. Uh, you'll notice that I'm not taking the time to actually go through and balance fuel. That's because I have put all of the liquid oxygen in the very nose of the uh, external fuel tank and the rest of it is just liquid hydrogen and just the balance offset of the weight of separating out the two uh, fuels have given this thing the uh, weight balance needed to just fly straight to orbit without me having to pay a whole lot of attention to it. Uh, making this thing actually a dream to fly. It's uh, <laughs> getting it off the pad and into orbit is surprisingly smooth and surprisingly easy. Just so long as none of your boosters fail and none of your J2s cut out, this thing actually rolls very smoothly. I'm very, very happy with the way this thing came out. Just a quick check on our liquid oxygen levels there. And with throttling, it's still a struggle to keep the acceleration here below about 8 Gs, but that comes with the territory. All right, and that's uh, main engine cutoff. You can see our uh, apogee is uh, a bit higher than I would have liked, uh, thus the angling a little down to try to correct some of that. But the periapsis is pretty much dead on for where I would expect it to be. Uh, our time to Apogee is about half an hour, which is fine. We're gonna coast up to something a little closer to that and then turn on our OMS system, which is two Asteris 2 engines, as you can see there. 
kind of close to the back of the spacecraft. But very quickly, I'm just going to double check and make sure this tank is actually completely empty. Yes, good it is. And then uh, ditch it. And that leaves us with just the orbiter. Alright, so we're going to get ourselves pointed a little bit towards prograde. And we'll bring our engine staging down to here. Alright, now the orbiter itself did carry a lot of uh, liquid oxygen and uh, liquid hydrogen. Ooh, yeah, it looks like we've got a little bit of a discrepancy there in our burn rates. But as long as it's in a centralized tank, it shouldn't be that big of a problem. Alright. And it does look like everything got burned uniformly, except for that little bit of oversight on some liquid oxygen. That's not a big deal. Okay. Um, now, initially, the plan was is to leave some of this uh, liquid hydrogen intact on the orbiter because it does carry fuel cells for electricity. It has no solar panels, although I do think it... I had the foresight to put some RTGs on there. Alright. Let's zoom way the hell back in here. Alright, looks like our Apogee bird is going to be at night. Many apologies. Whoop. Alright, and what kind of delta V are we looking at for that? 252. And I could have just left myself angled down because that's where the node is. To do <laughs> plenty of arazine and N2O. Let's say take a look at our delta Vs here. Yeah, about a kilometer per second. Although uh, we would like to save a lot of that for re-entry because uh, we need those RCS thrusters to hold attitude control until there's enough air uh, around the wing surfaces to do it for us. No big deal. All right, let's warp out to this node. Okay, it says burn time is 8 minutes and 7 seconds. So we'll uh, we'll get it to about the 4 minute and okay, well or I'll just zip right past it. No big deal. All right, I'll edge our engines. Yeah, I forgot. It would try to kick an ignition out of those J2s. That doesn't really matter. We're not getting any more fuel for them anyway. And we don't even really technically need to circularize our orbit, although it would make uh, a reentry profile a lot easier. So we're, this is going to be a long and boring burn. Is this, even those twin Asteris engines do, just do not provide a lot of thrust. They're not meant to be you know, a lift-worthy engine. Oh, wow, that rotated us all the way around. But they do serve as an OMS system pretty well, I, I must say. Let's see uh, how quickly we can speed this up. I guess we're going to try to circularize it 704, 704, or 700 by 700, whatever works for us. But it does take quite a while. That's why we're doing this in the time warp. Hmm. Okay, 743 by 680 is where we're going to leave it. Uh, that's a pretty nicely rounded orbit. We can go ahead and deactivate our RCS for the time being. We'd like to save some of that fuel after all. And let's get ourselves around to the daytime side so we can start doing some orbital operations here. I guess we're coming around the bottom half, so it'll be a little bit over Australia or so. A 
Okay, come on. Alright, and our tank just disappeared, burned up in the atmosphere below us. Alright, let's uh, turn the RCS system back on and roll ourselves into an appropriate attitude and start doing some of these orbital operations here. What's our electric charge looking like? Okay, dot eight three draw. We do have quite a lot of battery power, but it would have been nice to leave something for those fuel cells to use. Oh well, uh, for an inaugural flight, I don't intend on us being here very long. All right, open up our service bay. And the very first thing we can do is collect some solar particles, because that's an experiment we can bring home for 5.1 science. Keep. Yeah. Uh, toggle collectors. We can close those back up. What's our biome? Earth's water. I'm pretty sure we have pictures of that, but we'll just uh, double check. Ah, we do not. 15 science. Keep that experiment as well. All right. And now the real fun. We're going to deploy a satellite and boost it up into a higher orbit. So very first thing, we'll activate an antenna. Yeah, its electric charge has been drained. That's new and interesting. Uh, plenty of it to um, you know, make it work and whatnot. So we will uh, decouple, bounce. All right. Wow. Let's turn on your tanks. Nope. nope. Wrong way. Come on. All right. This guy's floating off. That's nice. Let's get the boot sequence here going. Bump. Bump. Activate. No target. All right. Uh, we're going to point one at Venus and one at Mars. Those are about the two targets that are within its range. Activate. Target. Earth. Oh, yeah. Scroll past all of these ground stations and everything around the moon before we finally get to Mars. All right. There we go. And uh, we will go ahead and get this thing pointed prograde and get its orbit boosted. This is our very first attempt at setting up some kind of comm network. <laughs> yeah, I know satellite burns are super interesting to watch. But I was thinking about um, 1 million by 1 million would be a good place to start these things off. Let's check on its electric charge. Good, it is charging with everything booted. I guess my only question about these satellites is would it have enough battery power to uh, complete an orbit? All right, well, there's that half. All right, uh, rename. Yeah, you're not going to be Restless Probe. You're going to be uh, Keyhole 1. Accept. Accept. Target switching locked. That's interesting. Cancel. So I can't rename you from here, huh? Oh yeah, I can. All right. Very good. Can't switch back to the space shuttle because we're too far away now. <laughs> uh.
All right. Well, that's uh, pretty much going to. Where did Restless go? What just happened? Switch to. Before it fades into oblivion. Excellent. All right. And uh, besides these satellites, the actual point of this mission was to get some training for a bunch of our Kerbals that have never actually flown before. Our entire engineer and science -y staff is taking their very first trip into orbit. Uh, at the helm is uh, Commander Alice Campbell, our veteran moon landing astronaut and Captain Extraordinaire. Um... Really, the satellites were just kind of a bonus to test out our lift capacity, which is obviously greater than even this. So if we scrapped the crew cabin and some of these science experiments, we could fit a pretty uh, decent tonnage in this cargo bay. Maybe even something that would could be lunar or interstellar capable. Uh, not crewed, obviously, but it's a, it's a nice way to launch automated vehicles. And for the total 95,000 credit cost of the vehicle itself, this is about 50 of it. So there's only about uh, 40,000 that we're losing in liquid hydrogen and clamps and those ridiculously overpriced Minutemen boosters. So as soon as we unlock some better solid rocket tech, uh, this thing will actually get cheaper to fly. And depending on how much trouble it gives me on the way down, will determine uh, how much service it gets. But again, this was just kind of like a, uh, a product of pride. I wanted to see if I could do it, and uh, based on testing, I'm pretty sure, although I'm going to let you guys watch me kill uh, almost every single astronaut we have when this thing fails on re-entry. I mean, hopefully not, but... <laughs> I'm really hoping not. I'm really hoping not, and I'm going to be super mad if this thing breaks when it hits the ground because wheels are stupid in 1.1.3. But, uh, alright, well, I'm going to deploy the rest of these satellites probably off-camera. There's no real point in making you watch me do that nine times and boost them into orbits and stuff like that. So, uh, that's going to do it for today's episode. Tomorrow, we're going to bring this thing back home or break it into a million pieces in the atmosphere at very high speed. So, thanks for hanging out, everybody. I do appreciate it. Um, see you tomorrow. Until then.